Hi, this is James, Master Trike Tech at Laidback Cycles, and welcome to our virtual clinic to keep you out of trouble. We're not going to teach you how to fix things or adjust things down to the nth degree. Primarily what it is, if you have a problem on top of the trail or while you're riding, we're going to give you enough information so that you can get back home and have your shop fix it. And at the end, we'll also be going through the general maintenance things. Okay, so the first thing is the brakes. So most of the trikes have disc brakes. One of the things that makes the modern trike uh, feasible. A couple of them have uh, drum brakes, but most of them are disc brakes and most of them are cable actuated. So these are the ones that we're gonna actually pay attention to. And the major issue Number one problem with brakes is actually just adjustment. People haven't been maintaining it correctly or they're riding a lot more miles they anticipate, which is really easy today now that we have motors and people riding much more. So as a simple adjustment, most of them are using something very similar to this Avid BB7. It's a cable actuated disc brake. For the most part, the way these brakes work is the outside brake sits still and the inside brake moves inward. If there's not enough pad on the outside, the rotor, the silver part over here, essentially rubs right against the caliper. So you have braking material on one side but nothing on the other side. And to adjust for that, how that works is a T25 wrench. Uh, these are not super common, but you will find them in most of the uh, emergency kits that they have, like uh, the Alien Tool or, or what have you. And this allows you to turn it inward. This will push the pad further out, giving you more braking power. If you get a little bit off and it's rubbing just a little bit, don't worry. The main thing that we're trying to do is just get home so you can get it to a shop and have it fixed. There's also a knob on the inside that does the exact same thing with the pad on the inner side. And alternately, there is this barrel adjuster, which does the same thing as the dial. It pulls out the cable and gives you more braking. Again, if you don't get it exactly right, don't worry about it too much. Uh, the object is to just get home. And the next thing we run into is the derailers. The derailers are a very evolved little device over here. So this cable over here pulls on this derailleur and that pulls it up through the gears. On top of modern derailleur systems, the upper gear and the lowest gear are adjusted with these screws over here. They determine how far the derailleur can go out so the chain doesn't drop into the spokes or too far in so they drop into the frame. If the chain is adjusted to gear number two and the shifter is adjusted to gear number two properly, every gear in between from two, in this case all up to nine, should be properly adjusted. So if it's not, and this is adjusted by this little barrel here. So as an example, that would be a derailleur that's out of adjustment. So what I do in this case is I bring it down to gear one, put it on two. And turn the barrel until the noise goes away. Two, three, four, five, six. It's a little off there, a half turn. So looking this way, counterclockwise makes the cable tighter, which brings the chain up higher. Clockwise makes the cable looser, brings the chain further down. 
So it just depends which way you have to go. And now this derailleur is adjusted. Now if you're on the trail and you get a bad luck and something whacks this whole thing, odds are if it's bad enough, this rear derailleur is gonna bend. And if that does it, a bunch of gears are not gonna work. My suggestion, pick one gear and then adjust the barrel adjuster until it stops making noise. And that's the gear you're gonna limp home in. Simple, easiest way to do that. Um, and then take it to your shop and have them assess it. If you're really lucky, the rear derailleur is not bent and it's just the hanger and you only need to have the hanger replaced. But it will depend on the severity of the impact. So the front derailleur, my best advice with the front derailleur, don't mess with it. It is the most primitive out of all the devices on top of a bike and hasn't substantially changed it in decades. Uh, most of them will use a friction shifter. What that means is there's no clicks. You just move the shifter to the point where it moves the chain and derailleur. And this one is out of adjustment. So front derailleurs largely have only two adjustments uh, as far as settings go. The rest of the adjustments are actually done by the angle, which is a little out of the scope of what we're trying to do here. But to make that knocking go away, what's happening is the crank arm is actually hitting the derailleur. So we use a screwdriver, half a turn at a time. And in this case, we're doing clockwise because that limits how far out it can go. And that fixed that problem like that. Same thing happens with the inside. If the chain keeps dropping, use a screw on the inside of the derailleur and that will limit how far the chain can fall down. That way it doesn't end up in here. If you're running into problems on the trail, uh, my recommendation, get that chain into the middle gear. Don't touch the uh, derailleur again. Uh, you're just trying to get home so that uh, you can have your shop uh, adjust and fix it. Front derailleurs very rarely have problems unless they're impacted. They're very protected. So most people will almost never have problems with front derailleurs until the cable housings and the cables themselves start uh, uh, getting worn. But that's pretty much it on derailleurs. So now we're down to the big number one, flats on the trail. So there are two thoughts on flats uh, for trikes. One is preventative. The other one is actually fixing the problem on the trail. So we're gonna talk a little bit about preventative first. So there are two major tire technologies, uh, things like uh, Slime and Mr. Tuffy's. We've been using those for decades and decades, but they've improved on that quite a bit uh, in the last few years, really. Many uh, tire manufacturers, including Schwabi, have introduced tires like the Marathon Plus. This particular tire puts an insert into the tire layer itself. And they use a fairly high-tech material. It's a high-tech thorn that if something pushes in, it tries to push it out before it can lodge itself into the uh, tire. The advantage to this is relatively low weight and it feels like a tire that doesn't have a whole lot of flat resistance. First generation flat resistance tires had a lot of resistance. When you stop pedaling, you could actually feel like the tire was fighting to go forward. Now, these tires don't have that issue. It's highly thorn resistant, but it's still possible to get a flat out of it. Uh, if you're looking for something that's a lot more thorn resistant, a company called Tannis has the new Armor tires. Uh, these are a little labor intensive to install, but they're a good alternative also. This will also fit into the tire casing. This is not the correct size for this, by the way. Uh, these have to be purchased fitted to the particular tire. It's not a one size fit all solution. So it is um, custom fitted to the tire size. And you have to typically use a smaller tube than what you're using. But there's so much material sitting in there that it is really hard to penetrate this. This probably, they won't actually tell us, but this probably uses a very similar technology to what's in the tire. It's a very dense uh, foam and 
you will lose a little bit of the bouncy effect, especially on balloon tires, but it will virtually make your tire flat proof well into the, mm, probably into the 99%. I haven't seen any issues with this with flats. And these are currently probably the two best uh, options for preventiveness of getting thorns or glass or what have you. But should you get a flat and you have my, something a little bit more conventional, like this racer tire, this tire does have a flat protection in, but it is not high on the scale of uh, tires that do have flat protection. So eventually you get a flat on that. Those of you that have a press the valve, you need to unscrew the little head and let the air out. For the Schrader valve, which is the same one they use in the cars, it's just removing the plastic cap and pushing in the pin. Most people are familiar with that type of valve. People are always asking me, James, James, what's the secret to getting the tire off? Well, the secret is that the rim is a little bit of a U shape. So it's lower here than it is up here where the bead of the tire normally sits. So breaking the bead off the rim, both sides, will allow that tire, if you squeeze it, to sit more in the middle of that U. And then with your trusty tire levers, generally I start on the other side of the valve. And the reason for that is the way the tube is shaped. I'll show you that a little later. With one tire level, I add a little bit of pull. And then I squeeze all of this, getting that bead into the middle of the rim. And you can kind of see already that there's way less tension on top of the tire lever. Once one side comes off, the other side is pretty easy too, but you don't need to, especially on a trike. The front wheel is not obstructed by anything, so you don't need to actually take the wheel off to change out the tube. And the tube comes out. And here's the reason that I don't start pulling off the tire where the stem is. The stem is covered by a very thick rubber piece over here and getting the tire lever into that area is just a bit harder. It's stiffer, doesn't want to move as much, so it's easier to start someplace else. Okay, so the first thing to do is to find the hole, and you should have one of these. If you don't have an emergency pump, um, getting stranded on the road is never fine. I mean, cycling two miles, easy to do. Walking the trike back two miles, that, that's not fun. So you're going to pump this thing up and look for the, where the air leak is. This one actually doesn't have an air leak, but we're going to pretend that it does. Ideally, you should have a spare tube sitting in your trike and then fix it when you go home. So we pump it up. This can actually be pumped a lot more. And we're going to say the hole is right here. Keep an eye on that point because when you let the air out, everything shrinks and sometimes it'll make that little mark you're looking at disappear. Some people actually bring little pens with them so they can put an X on top of it. The patch kit, it has three components in it. It has the glue, which is technically not a glue, the patch, and the little roughing spreader tool, which is essentially just sandpaper on rubber. So the first thing is make sure you didn't lose the spot where the hole is. Rough up the tube. And this will prepare it for the glue, which is actually a vulcanizing agent. The thing that's very important about this is that you let it dry. And that's why it's technically not a glue. It prepares the rubber uh, to bond with the patch. So this has to completely dry 
typically out there, it's about five minutes. There are ways to cheat, like, but it is actually best to let it dry on its own. I know everybody's standing around you. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? But it's best not to rush this. If you put this patch on while it's wet, odds are it's not going to bond correctly. Okay, and five minutes later, it's all dry. This just goes over, and as soon as it makes contact, it's already bonded. Uh, you don't have to do anything special at this point. Just rub it in really, really good. And this is a permanent fix. Uh, it bonds, becomes part of the rubber, just like this other one that I did at my last clinic. It's not going anywhere. Uh, it's a good seal. they are quick uh, patches or versions of the quick patches where you just slap it on. Those will work short term. Sometimes they'll work long term, but that's really a flip of a coin. The purposes of those are really, uh, it's a race thing. Because for racers, if they wait five minutes, uh, it's here to weigh the heck down over there. Uh, with a quick patch as they're doing it, slap on and go. And then it's um, good to go back into the, uh, the trike. So I'll stem in first. And it's good to have a little bit of air pumped into it. That'll give it a little bit of volume. And the reason we want to do that is to avoid the dreaded pinch flat. Pinch flats occur when the bead of the tire catches the tube and squeezes it up against the rim. Uh, that can be insidious because that doesn't always mean it'll pop right away. Uh, it is possible when you're inflating it that there's enough force so that it literally clamps and seals the uh, tube. And everything's fine until the tire flexes or it loses a little bit of pressure, then all of a sudden... <laughs> so that's something you want to avoid. So putting it on, same thing. Squeezing it down so that the center sits more in the middle of the rim and that'll give you more space up here. If you have strong hands, you can actually muscle it on, but most of us at this point don't. There's absolutely nothing wrong with using a tire lever to carefully lift it up. Make sure that you don't feel the tube in there. If you feel the tube in there, stop, back off a little bit, tuck it back in. In this case, just because I've done a bazillion of these, I know there's no tube sticking out. Um, but if there was, that is an indicator that uh, you could pinch it and then you'd have to do it all over again. Once the tire is sitting in the rim, you want to pull it over and make sure that there's no tube coming up the edges of the tire bead because that likewise can lead to a pinch flat. Uh, this motion over here also tends to tuck the tube a little bit higher up in the tire so that we don't have to worry about pinch flats. And we like this pump because it has a little peg and on the ground you can use it like a floor pump. But since we're in a shop, I'm going to use it like an old-fashioned hand pump. And you don't have to get it up to the full 85 PSI. You are just trying to get home in most paces. 50, 60, 70 is more than enough. So this is one of the few um, emergency pumps that'll get you up to a high uh, pressure. A lot of emergency pumps, uh, it's really hard to pump after 30 or 40. So whatever you need to get home. And according to this uh, gauge, which is typically not the most accurate on emergency uh, pumps, I'm sitting at about 45. Uh, and I'm gonna call that good because I'm tired. I'm gonna go home and use my full-size pump. And that's how you change a tube. On a side note, people have asked me, uh, why do we use plastic? Why don't we use uh, metal? And the reason for that is that aluminum rims, not so much the newer ones, but when they first switched over, they were quite a bit softer. Uh, as a result of the metal 
uh, tire levers that they used to use uh, would scratch those things up, especially if they were anodized like this. So they started coming out with these. Uh, for the most part, there really is no reason to use the metal ones uh, unless you're using downhill racing tires. Uh, they're just um, rough and hard. Using proper techniques, uh, the plastic ones are more than adequate. They will break over time. Um, they are kind of disposable, but you know, better this than your rim. Uh, this wheel currently, I think, is $150 to replace. So yeah, save yourself some money and don't destroy your rims. Now comes to general maintenance. And this actually is one of the more simple things. Lube your chain about every 200 miles and keep your trike clean. That's it, really. So chain lubrication, there are two ways to go about that. You can use any high quality bike lube. Run the chain backwards. And one revolution. Usually I mentally just follow the chain. Some people can't do that. It's fine to put a little mark on one of them and do that about every 200 miles. We also have this cool little device by Finish Line, no drip. This allows you to put any lube in, in it. And all you do is squeeze a little bit, saturate that pad, same thing, backwards, one revolution. Uses a little pad over here. That's actually kind of cool because it cleans the chain a little bit, cleans off any um, hard muck that's on top of it. One revolution is all it takes about every 200 miles. That's really it. Do not pressure wash in a trike. Please do not do that. Uh, high pressure water can actually pull the lubrication out of bearings and that's bad all the way around. But these trikes really don't require a whole lot of maintenance, uh, but we recommend a schedule about every year to do a full tune up. That's um, where we go through possibly needing to change out the cable housings and the cables, especially if the cables are corroded or these have um, basically worn out. If it gets worn out, it will affect the shifting. Uh, same with the brakes. Uh, we check the chain, especially those of you with electric motors. We've kind of altered a little bit different for people with electric motors. They should have us check the trike out twice a year. So one half year interval is where we just check it to make sure everything is settled in. It might need a minor adjustment, maybe brake adjustments. Um, and then one full tune-up at the end of the year. Maintenance is relatively easy. Uh, just keep it clean and lube the chain. That's all you need to do. So that's it for our maintenance workshop. If you have any questions, put it down in the comment or visit your local shop. Most of the shops will be happy to answer questions that you may have on it.